do, but I don't feel at all jeopardized in the United States now. It's not every day that a government tries to deport one of Human Rights Watch's researchers. And given that that's what the Netanyahu government was trying to do, I thought it was very important to demonstrate the stakes at issue and come here myself for what we thought would be the Supreme Court hearing. Now, the hearing has been postponed, which we take as welcome news, because that comes at a moment when there really has been rapidly mounting global outrage at what almost everybody sees as an effort to censor legitimate human rights advocacy. And so I hope that the Israeli government uses this hiatus as a moment of reflection, to recognize that its effort to sort of pretend that this is only about one researcher in his past, that nobody sees, and everybody sees through that excuse, that everybody recognizes that what's really at stake here is the ability to engage in human rights advocacy, which may be uncomfortable for the Israeli government, but is completely legitimate and mainstream, even within the Israeli public. Generally, um, or to some extent, lost faith as well. There currently is a court order enabling Omar Shakir to stay in Israel until there is a final decision on his case, with, which ultimately we hope will be a positive decision. So the plan for now is that Omar Shakir continues to be Human Rights Watch's representative in Israel-Palestine. Um, and I hope that that continues for a long, long time, because we anticipate a positive ruling in the end. Um, but frankly, even if the Supreme Court were to go the other way, ultimately the decision to enforce a deportation order is the government's. So while for the moment we're looking at the court, in the end it's the government that has to act or not act. And we hope that either the Netanyahu government or any successor government will recognize that the world sees through the excuses that it's making with respect to Omar Shakir, recognizes that what's really at stake is free speech and legitimate human rights advocacy. And so Israel does not want to join the narrow set of abusive governments that bar Human Rights Watch representatives. Or even if he could then cobble together a government, is there enough time for him to get an amnesty provision? Well, the irony is that the Israeli government's position is driven by its fear of the so-called BDS movement, the boycott, divest, and sanctions movement. Now, why they chose Human Rights Watch to make this case, I don't know, because Human Rights Watch actually has never advocated boycotting Israel. Um, we don't endorse the BDS movement. But what they did is they looked back into kind of the ancient college history of the Human Rights Watch researcher and said, well, back then he did, so we're going to penalize him. But the point is that even this Israeli law is not supposed to be punitive for the past. It's supposed to be preventive for the future. And the government was unable to come up with any evidence that Omar Shakir had ever deviated from Human Rights Watch's positions during the entire tenure of his employment with Human Rights Watch. So this is really um, a misguided effort to strike back against BDS, which everybody sees is in fact becoming just an effort to censor um, a widely respected, broadly viewed as legitimate organization that is simply reporting what it is with respect to Israeli conduct in the occupied territories. He's looking, he's desperate to get something through to try to get some kind of amnesty before October. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, many people have wondered, you know, why did the Netanyahu government try to pull this off this time? And, you know, frankly, I think part of the explanation is just domestic Israeli politics. Things are moving to the right. And so something that Netanyahu actually chose not to do just two years ago, um, he now feels he can get away with or maybe has to do in order to placate the far right within Israel. I think Trump's embrace of Netanyahu, as if Netanyahu can never do anything wrong, may have emboldened him as well. But, you know, fortunately, most of the world is not in the same place as Netanyahu and Trump. Most of the world still believes in the Geneva Conventions. Most of the world still believes in the legitimacy of human rights advocacy. And those are the things that are at stake here. And I think that um, given the global outrage at this effort to deport the Human Rights Watch researcher, this is an opportunity for the Netanyahu government to reassess and to recognize that you know, it doesn't want to join the ranks of North Korea, Iran, Sudan, Cuba, and Venezuela in being one of those handful of governments that bars Human Rights Watch researchers. You need to rule by decree, so to speak. <laughs> well, I don't know, because I think it's too Actually, what, what people don't recognize is that Human Rights Watch's program on the United States is our largest country program in the world. And indeed, Human Rights Watch has been doing intensive work most recently on the child separations on the border, um, the efforts to undermine the right to seek asylum, um, the various Trump efforts to demonize immigrants, to um, promote racist views, to, to really you know, undermine human rights enforcement at home. And, and this, of course, presents a problem globally as well, because traditionally, while the US government has never been a, you know, a, a, a regular promoter of human rights, it at least has been a government that we could look to from time to time. And, and that is not 
terribly productive under Trump. You know, Trump is so busy embracing autocrats that he's not the most credible um, articulator of human rights principles. So we've had to look elsewhere. Um, but the good news is that there are other governments who have been willing to step up to the plate. And, and whether it's you know, Saudi abuses in Yemen or um, Russian indiscriminate bombardment in Syria or Myanmar crimes against humanity against the Rohingya or even China's persecution of the Uyghur Muslims, there are governments willing to stand up. Um, and typically it's not the United States, but there are other coalitions of governments that continue to be a powerful voice for human rights and have cost all of those governments to react and, and to be less abusive than they might have been. You know, so he's, he's kind of has his back up against the wall right now. Okay. Yeah, yeah.